These are the Crawley sisters. You know them from Downton Abbey. You may remember this look, or this one, and of course this one. But are they accurate? We got this fashion historian. I'm Raisa Britannia, and I'm a fashion historian. To walk us through what Downton Abbey got right and what they got mostly right about these looks. First, let's establish the setting. The series is set at the fictional Downton Estate, located in Yorkshire, at the early 20th century. We begin season one in April of 1912 with the sinking of the Titanic, and season six concludes on New Year's Eve of 1925. The show centers around the fictional aristocratic Crawley family. The Crawley sisters were subject to strict social customs of dress, which were required of ladies in their social positions. They changed five to seven times a day, which required the assistance of a lady's maid. Repetition of garments was common, and this is realistically depicted in the show. Overall, the costume department of Downton Abbey was dedicated to historical accuracy in their meticulous research of the era. Let's get into the looks. First up, Sybil's Jupe Culotte Ensemble. This look appears in Season 1, Episode 4, which takes place in May 1913. Costume designer Susanna Buxton helped bring to life this jupe culotte ensemble, which was perhaps one of the most memorable costumes of the series. The top half of the costume was made from an antique bodice from the early 1910s, combined with the metallic lace sleeves of another antique dress. This was an avant-garde ensemble that was meant to shock the Crawley family and demonstrated Sybil's forward-thinking ideals. She's also the character who wears the most avant-garde styles. Her ideals were exemplified by this ensemble because jupe culottes were often associated with the women's rights movement, and that was one that Lady Sybil was passionate about. Let's draw Sybil's jupe culotte look layer by layer. First up, the undergarments. The innermost undergarment would either be a combination or a set of chemise and drawers. These undergarments would be made of cotton and would include decorative details like lace or ribbon insertion. Next up, the stockings. These stockings would be finely knitted and fastened above the knee using garters, which may have been attached to the bottom edge of the corset. And then the corset. Despite this shockingly modern ensemble, a woman of Lady Sybil's social position would still be expected to wear traditional undergarments, which did include a corset. Corsets in 1913 aimed to elongate the torso, beginning just under the bust and extending down to about mid-thigh. The brassiere, or bra, would be patented in 1914, but women were not necessarily quick to adopt it. That brings us to the jupe culotte layer. Jupe culotte literally translates to skirt trousers. These were loose, voluminous trousers that gathered at the ankle and were sometimes called Turkish trousers or harem pants. They were championed by such avant-garde designers as Paul Poiret, whose orientalist designs from the early 20th century are legendary in fashion history. And now the shoes. Sybil wears a standard pair of evening shoes from the period, which were made of silk with a curved heel and a single strap. Next up, gloves. Lady Sybil wears champagne-colored elbow-length gloves. Women of this social status were expected to wear gloves with an evening ensemble, but they would be removed when eating dinner. What about her hair? In this scene, Lady Sybil wears her hair in a low twisted chignon, which would be appropriate for a formal scene in 1913. However, this wouldn't have necessarily been required of her at this point in the series. In the first half of season one, we occasionally see her wearing her hair down, and that is because she had not yet been presented to society. Finally, the last layer. Sybil wears a wide metallic embroidered headband with an inset jewel to match her blue ensemble. According to the costume designer, this was an original antique piece from the period. This is accurate, but there is another option for a fashionable accessory here. Because jupe culotte ensembles were influenced by orientalist design, the most avant-garde women would sometimes opt to wear a fashionable turban instead. Like Sybil's headpiece, there was often a central decorative element like a stone, or more extravagantly, a spray of feathers. This ensemble points to a very specific point in fashion history, and it is quite accurate. 
So here's what Sybil would have looked like compared to the original look from the series. Pretty much the same. Let's move on to Lady Edith. This look appears in Season 3, Episode 8, which takes place in late summer of 1920. This look by costume designer Caroline McCall was the quintessential mid-1920s daytime city look. While it is technically accurate, we would not have seen this in the summer of 1920. This look actually bears closer resemblance to styles from 1923 or 24. We actually see Lady Edith wearing a very similar look with the same hat in the following season. One reason for this design choice may be to create a stark contrast between the wartime realities of season two and the new urban setting of the London season, which is season three. Now we're going to draw every layer of this look. First, the undergarments. The innermost garment would be a version of the combination, but overall a bit smaller and more lightweight. By 1920, the ideal body was transitioning into one with de-emphasized curves. It became fashionable to flatten the bust rather than accentuate it. This is why the corset evolved into the girdle, which was a lightly boned undergarment that flattened the hips and created a columnar silhouette. And then the stockings. Stockings were still worn and were secured using suspender-like garters, which were often attached to the bottom edge of the girdle. Then the third layer. A slip added a smoothing layer between the undergarments and the outer dress. It would have been loose fitting and boxy to match the silhouette of the dress worn over it. Next up, the dress. Edith's peach shift dress appears to be lightweight and could have been made of rayon, which was actually called artificial silk until 1924. The dress features two pleated inset panels and a row of buttons that emphasize the design's verticality. The low slung waistline is a commonly referenced hallmark of 1920s fashion. However, this is a change that happened gradually and it was more common in the mid 1920s. In the summer of 1920, the waistline would not have yet reached the level of the hips. In reality, the dress designs from about 1919 to 1921 were transitional and featured waistlines that sat below the natural waist but still above the level of the hips. Aside from the placement of the waistline, Edith's dress is pretty accurate. What about her coat? Edith wears a light summer weight coat, which appears to be made of a uniquely woven jacquard or matelassé. It is left open to reveal the dress underneath. The coat is decorated with floral appliques that match the peach tones of the dress, and these could have been added by the costume department to an existing vintage coat. It is incredibly modern and well-made, which speaks to Edith's youth and social position. And then the shoes. Edith's shoes are light colored and likely made of leather. They feature a sturdy heel and a strap, which would have been appropriate for her life in the city. Next up, Edith's hair. Edith's hair remains long, but it's styled in a way to create the look of the fashionable shorter hairstyles of the period. This style is called a finger wave or Marcel wave, and it is achieved using a curling iron, which we see Anna practicing with in season two. This style could also be achieved by using a combination of pomade and wave clips. And of course, the hat. Edith wears a light colored hat with an upturned brim and a peach hat band to coordinate with her ensemble. During the early 1920s, hat brims became narrower and started to fit closer to the head. This would eventually give way to the bell-shaped cloche style, which became synonymous with the time period. Overall, Edith blossoms in London, and her clothes reflect that of a smartly dressed urban woman of the era. So this is what Edith would have looked like compared to the original. Again, almost exactly the same. Finally, let's take a look at Mary's gown. This look appears in season six, episode nine, which is the series finale, and this takes place in December of 1925. The last two seasons and the film were designed by Anna Mary Scott Robbins and were set at the height of the Jazz Age. At this point of the series, we see costumes that audiences can readily identify as the 1920s. Actress Michelle Dockery wore a real antique Fortuny gown, which was a treat to see on screen because these garments are usually meticulously preserved in museum collections. 
this was the first time a Delphos gown was ever worn in a television series. It was lent by the Fortuny Archive along with two velvet coats worn by Lady Mary and Lady Rose. This ensemble is true to Lady Mary's character. She's a woman of very refined taste who prefers streamlined simplicity over excessive ornamentation. Let's draw Mary's look layer by layer. First up, undergarments. Lady Mary has the fashionably slender figure for the period and wouldn't require any extensive undergarments for shaping. Her undergarments may have consisted of a simple bandeau style brassiere and a pair of short drawers. This style of bra was popular during the 1920s and was worn by women who naturally possessed the fashionably flat chest. Let's move on to the next layer. She would be wearing silk stockings secured with garters. These garters would have been elasticated and incorporated some sort of decorative trimming. Perhaps the most impressive layer, the Fortuny Delphos gown. The Delphos gown was designed by Mariano Fortuny and so called for its resemblance to the garment worn by the ancient Greek bronze sculpture, the Charioteer at Delphi. It was made from two rectangular panels of dyed silk, which were intricately pleated using a system of machinery that Fortuny patented in 1909. Since then, the method of pleating has been one of fashion history's most closely guarded secrets. The side seams and shoulder seams were not sewn, but rather fastened with a series of pins called fibulae. Lady Mary wears a variation of the Delphos gown known as the peplos, which featured a short tunic layer. Small Venetian glass beads were stitched to the bottom edge to weigh down the hem and to preserve the straight line of the garment. It's essential to note that the Delphos gown was originally designed as a tea gown. The tea gown was an Edwardian era garment that was worn by society women in the home. In 1909, Fortuny was shocked to find out that society's boldest women were actually wearing their Delphos gowns out of the house. By the mid-1920s, it became common for modern women to wear them as evening dresses. Because she is wearing an actual garment from the period, it really doesn't get more accurate than this. Next up, the shoes. We never see Mary's shoes in this scene, but we can assume that she's wearing some type of silk evening shoe with a curved heel and a decorative element. And then the hair. In season five, Lady Mary cuts her long hair into a stylish shingle bob. This style is notable for its angular sides that accentuate the cheekbones. The back of the bob is cropped high above the hairline with a pointed base at the nape. This hairstyle was favored by film flappers like Colleen Moore and Louise Brooks. Finally, her jewelry. Lady Mary wears a thin headband across her forehead, and these headpieces were standard for evening dress in the 1920s. She occasionally wears a tiara to dinner, which was an accessory reserved for married aristocratic women. She also wears a long chain necklace, which was favored during this time period because it emphasized the fashionable flatness of the chest. And she wears long drop earrings that dangle below her bobbed hair. Overall, her jewelry is very understated, which reflects her preference for elegance and simplicity. Lady Mary's look is perfection and absolutely accurate. So this is what Mary would have looked like compared to the look in the series finale. Very accurate! Any final thoughts? Overall, Downton Abbey is the gold standard for period dramas, with particular enthusiasm placed on the costumes.